We're going to be shifting our focus now and uh, we'll be speaking to Saul Miller. Um, he is a portfolio manager at Truffle and he'll be uh, giving us some perspective on the balanced fund. Um, and of course, uh, an interesting one again is that uh, the balanced fund is also uh, celebrating its 10th year and that will be coming up at the end of uh, or at the end of October. Saul, thank you so much uh, for making the time to join us today. Uh, we've seen you and your team being able to display uh, great skill and expertise when it comes to managing this multi-asset portfolio. And of course, for this reason, that we're very excited to hear from you. So uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to hand over to you and we'll try and sneak in a question or two afterwards. Great. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me and thanks everybody for, for tuning in. So I'm going to speak a little bit about some of our views on the global economy and the domestic economy. And then in particular, talking about this balancing act that is um, that is, you know, is connected to SA exposure, given that we have moved a little bit more positively on SA in the last year. But obviously, given the events of the last week, the balancing act has become even more, more delicate. That's just the performance of the fund. It's a Reg 28 fund, so it's suitable for pension investment. Um, you can see the track record going back almost 10 years, so we, we've done nicely. I'm not going to harp on much about this. It's all in your, in your fact sheets. So with that, let me our presentation. So starting with what's happening in the globe and in particularly in the US, you'll see on the chart on the left, I've put up a picture or a, or a graph of US debt to GDP. The purpose of it isn't to sort of ring alarm bells on high debt levels. It's really to just put into context the size of the stimulus that we've had in the US. And remember, we're looking at 100 years of data here. So if you if you look at that, the extent of that increase in debt that's captured in that rectangle, you can see how meaningful that is just relative to the last 100 years. Other thing that's also important to bear in mind is that the stimulus is going to continue. You see on the chart on the right, the U.S. is expected to run fairly significant budget deficits for the next sort of five to seven years. And you get a similar picture if we had to overlay this with the rest of the developed world. So also a lot of stimulus there as well. So as a result, we expect GDP to be above trend GDP in the next year or two, um, and certainly above what that trend would have been prior to COVID. So in other words, we expect the economy to almost be at full capacity. When your GDP is above trend GDP, that tends to be inflationary. This is more a medium-term concern than a short-term concern, so I'm not really talking about what's happening at the moment when you've got these bottlenecks and supply chain issues and high commodity prices. That kind of stuff can get worked out of the system, and you might even see some deflation next year. But when you've got a positive output gap, in other words, where your GDP is well above trend as a result of all the stimulus, that certainly can result in um, inflation, especially given that it should push up employment levels, which should push up wages, and that obviously is also inflationary. So we do worry about inflation Inflation on a more than of a medium-term horizon. All this growth in the stimulus has obviously found its way into savings, and you're finding it, and a lot of that savings is being spent, and it's being deployed in the economy, and we're seeing that in earnings expectations. Here you have earnings for the S&P 500, the bottom line in, in green, uh, you can see that's updated um, to, to the current date, uh, which is the middle of the year. If you look at the red line, that was earnings expectations, the beginning of 2020, before COVID hit us. You can see what the trajectory was. And you can see currently, given the improvement that we've seen in the U.S. economy, the current forecast is back to that trend line, which you see in that uh, large circle. So this has obviously helped drive up the S&P 500, given that Things obviously improved a lot more quickly than expected. We saw these rapid earnings revisions. You've probably seen the bulk of that at this stage, given that we are back to that pre pre trend level. So this 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 positive impact that has driven the S and P up is probably going to be a little bit less going forward. The other thing that's obviously driven up valuations, uh, not just in the S and P but globally, has been interest rates that have come down quite dramatically. And what's interesting to do here is to look at, and we're looking at U.S. ten-year interest rates, to break them up into two components. It's the real rate, which is the rate that you earn on an inflation-linked bond, and the difference between the real rate and the nominal or the fixed-rate bond is what the market expects for inflation. We can call that implied inflation over the next 10 years. That's been fairly stable over the last 20 odd years. So you can see it's ranged 
roughly at about 2%. So despite all the stimulus that we've had, current expectations for inflation implied by bonds is a little bit over that. It's about 2.2.3. So the market doesn't seem particularly concerned about inflation. Now, if that is the case and inflation doesn't land up being a major issue, the question is why are investors prepared to pay such high prices for inflation protection? In other words, why are they paying up high prices for inflation-linked bonds? or in other words, earning such poor negative real yields. And you can see from the chart, real yields are now as negative as they've ever been. They are very, very depressed relative to history. They're, as of today, they're less than minus one. So it doesn't really make sense that you're not worried about inflation, but yet you're, you are prepared to earn a terrible return on a security that's supposed to protect you from inflation. So we think something has to give over time. Either inflation is going to surprise on the upside or these real yields are going to have to rise up. Either way, we think bond yields are going to push up. And that is a that's obviously a risk can have an impact on equity market valuations as well. One of the factors that has obviously driven yields down has been tapering or QE. Not, not we haven't had tapering yet. And what you can see in this chart is the proportion of total outstanding debt that is owned by the Fed. And if you look at index linked securities, which is the dark green line, you'll see that they used to own less than 9%. That's now nearly 22%. And that's just really over the space of a, of a year and a half. So you can imagine what percentage of the daily demand the Fed has actually been. This at some stage will need to come to an end. Um, and that obviously means a huge source of demand for these inflation linked bonds will obviously come out of the market. And that should result in some pricing pressure and an increase in uh, in yields. So that really is more of a medium concern. We've obviously been wrong in the short term, given how strong we've seen yields or how low yields have actually been. Now, the reason why it's important, as I said, is that it impacts valuations. And you can see that quite clearly in this diagram over here. And what we, we have here is we have current PEs of various different markets. And we compare that to their 10 year medians. And you'll see if you look at the growthy sectors, which are your long duration type assets, they tend to be much more sensitive to interest rates, much like a long bond would be more sensitive uh, than a short dated bond. So you get that impact in your growthy shares, your tech type shares, and you can see that in these valuations where the MSCI World Growth Index is substantially above its history at 62%. Obviously, the countries that have more exposure to these growthy shares, like the S&P, are also quite expensive relative to their history, whereas the value type style is not as expensive. Also a little bit above average, but not particularly expensive. And not everything is expensive in the world. As you can see, SA is trading at quite a deep discount. Admittedly, some of that is due to high commodity prices. When you have high commodity prices, your miners will trade on low PEs. But even if we strip that out, you'll see that valuations for a lot of SA shares are actually quite cheap, particularly SA industrials and financials are at a discount to where they've been historically. And that's really probably the first pillar that I should mention in terms of why we became a bit more optimistic about SA roughly, um, roughly a year ago. Just one more comment before I move on to SA. Uh, just a comment on um, on metal prices and Chinese credit. So what we have here are we have uh, metal prices or basket of metal prices, and we have what's called the Chinese credit impulse. A so credit impulse is just the rate of change of debt in China. Why is that important? Well, it's important because that debt that China issues usually gets invested into fixed capital formation, which gets used for commodities. And China consumes 50% or more than 50% of many commodities. So one of those commodities being iron ore. So obviously I raised that one because a lot of SA miners have exposure to iron ore. So we certainly have a bit of a worry that that could come under pressure given that we have seen this impulse fall. We haven't seen iron ore pressure, we haven't seen iron ore come under pressure yet. There have been supply constraints. But we worry about it in the medium term. If you look at profitability levels for iron ore miners, they are at record high levels, higher than they were during the super cycle of over 15 years ago, as China was emerging from a small emerging market to a, a, a developed or a large, a large global player. So there's certainly a concern. Um, and we actually prefer PGMs more, given that China is far less significant. Um, less, it's, it's not as significant a player in the PGM market, but I'll talk a little bit more about that when I get towards the end of the presentation. I'm going to move on to SA now. Uh, we've often spoken about um, the structural issues facing South Africa. You're all aware of them. You can see them on the right hand side of the chart with their unemployment, education, high debt levels. These are obviously very difficult things to, to fix. And this is what we always temper, I suppose, our enthusiasm for for SA, um, SA type Inc companies. Um, 
these are structural concerns. That doesn't mean you don't have cyclical factors. We do have, you know, you also do have um, have um, have cycles within a structural trend, and we think it's important to to bear that in mind. And cyclically, at least, we were certainly getting a bit more optimistic over the last um, over the last year, just given the changes that we've seen. And I've listed them on the chart on the left. Very recently, we've actually seen vaccination uptake really improving. If it wasn't for the events of the last week, that should have continued. But that certainly finally seems to be to be coming through. We've seen improvements in um, in corruption, with Zuma going to jail and ACES suspension being upheld. We think these are positive factors. You've obviously got real cyclical macro factors like high commodity prices are great for our terms of trade and our tax collection. And then factors that could actually impact more structural impacts in essays, like some of our economic reforms. And the most significant one, for me at least, is this is, um, is self-provision of power, which we think is hugely positive. It obviously will ease the burden of load shedding, and it means you will get some capex investment into the country, which we think is critical, because that hopefully might encourage other businesses or private businesses to start investing as well. We can do that. We can hopefully get GDP growth up and reduce our debt to GDP. A quick chart on the miners here, and this is mining capex and capex intentions going forward. You can see it's been fairly low for the last couple of years, but there certainly is an intention to up that capex dramatically. It's not just good for for miners; it's also good for their ancillary industries and employment in those ancillary industries. So we think this is certainly a, a positive trend that we hope to see to see more. Of. We've also seen quite a recovery in the JSC over the last year, and that's really been driven by significant upward revisions in earnings, which you can see on the chart on the on the right. And some of that's been through fantastic cost control. You know, we've seen that in some of the banks. It's also been just through the fact that economy, the economy has recovered um, more strongly than we had expected. And that's pretty much in keeping with um, with what we've seen globally. So this has certainly been, been good for for the SA for the SA market. We done. Well, as I mentioned, we think that the SA market is offering quite a reasonable amount of value, particularly in certain sectors. So we actually reduced some of our exposure and some of our offshore um, industrials like, like Nuspers and other expensive ones like uh, Richmond. And we invested that in some of the SA counters. As I said earlier, financials are particularly cheap. You've got APSA trading at a discount to its NAV. It should generate, uh, it should cover its cost of equity. In other words, it should trade at a premium. It's on very high dividend yields, probably a sustainable normalized dividend yield of over seven. And then we have the insurers trading on massive discounts, um, very, very deep relative to the, to the history. And as a result, you've actually seen Liberty now being being taken out by Standard Bank, and that's obviously been positive for us, given that we have a liberty also in Met, uh, Metropolitan, Momentum Metropolitan. On the industrial front, you also see a lot of very cheap um, counters, whether it's Telcom on EV, EBITDA multiples of less than three, Renbro trading on a 40% discount, or a quality business like a Netcare, very defensive, very cash flow generative, trading on a single digit PE. It's only not defensive in a COVID environment, but once we get through this, it generally is a very defensive business. You would expect their volumes to return to what they were pre-COVID. So to get that on a, on a sort of nine normalized PE, we think is fantastic. The retailers are a little bit more expensive, but certainly not, not expensive relative to history, but not they're not necessarily single digit PEs, but they are fairly high quality businesses with good returns, the likes of a Pepcorp or, or a Willys. Just a quick comment on PGMs, given that we do have a reasonable exposure here. You know, we prefer this to some of the other metals. What do we like about PGMs? Well, we think deficits will be sustained um, in the PGM space, much more so than, let's say, the iron ore space, where there's no shortage of, um, of supply. PGMs have come under a bit of pressure of late, particularly palladium and rhodium, and part of that relates to the pressures we're seeing in the global motor car industry. There's been huge chip shortages as a result. Motor manufacturers haven't been able to produce motor cars, um, and that's why you've actually seen stock levels absolutely plummet to record lows, and we've got over 30 years of data, so you can see how unusual um, this looks. And you would expect, given that they can't build cars at the moment, they're probably not paying up for these high rhodium and palladium prices. Once these chips come through and we start the building process on track again, we would think the demand for rhodium and palladium comes back. So, so that should be a, an underpin for your, your PGM shares, which actually also trading on very low valuations. You're talking sub, sub four PEs for, for many of them. So hence, we, we maintain our, our overweight in that, um, 
And then just a quick comment on, on property. We've generally or historically, we've been quite bearish on property in terms of there just being too much space that's been that's been built up, whether it's office, whether it's um, middle to high end retail. So that's always been a concern for us. We just think post COVID, the sell off was so extreme where you were trading at half um, half NAV. We just felt there were some opportunities that couldn't be ignored given those valuations. And so we did up our, our property exposure. Um, in select and fairly select counters, so we have tried broadly to, to stay away from your sort of affluent retail or your, or your office. You know, we preferred other sectors like your more rural retail or your logistics type players. But we have had a reasonable recovery, as you can as you can see. And as a result, we've actually reduced our, our property quite meaningfully once again post that, that recovery. And that we did for recently. Uh, um, this is just a list of our of our top holdings. I've covered quite a few of these, so I'm not going to go into too much detail over here. I'm going to show you one more slide, which is just our asset allocation. We're roughly around what we would consider to be neutral equity exposure. If you put in, if you add property to that, that's 63 in equity. It takes us to sort of 67 in in real assets. It's not as high as it's been, as I obviously this this talks to our worries around interest rates and high valuations. So one of the ways one of the ways we've protected against these high valuations is we've actually put hedges into our portfolio. So we have hedged some of our offshore holdings and we've hedged some of our, our domestic holdings, as you as you can see um, in the in the light green shadings. That is my um, that's 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 my story. Uh, I hope you found that interesting. Um, yeah, I I go I revert back to you for any questions. Oh, certainly very interesting. So just uh, one question from me. Uh, you and the Truffle team have spoken about the relative expensiveness of um, U.S. equities. Apart from South Africa, where else would you say you are seeing value from an equity valuations uh, perspective, if at all? Yeah, there is there, there is value. There's value in the in what would be called traditional value type sectors. So I know the one that really sticks out is the financial sector or in particular banks, whether it's the US and or, or Europe or the UK. We've seen quite a lot of value. We're seeing a lot of counters that are trading at a deep discounted book. Um, they have done reasonably well as bond rates started to creep up, but they have now come under pressure again, as we've seen this this, this dramatic fall in, um, in in treasury yields. Generally, they're quite correlated with those those treasury yields or, or yield curves. They do better when rates rise, especially you know, they particularly suffer when you've got um, when you've got such low rates. It doesn't really work for their business model. So we would think. That over time there should be um, there should certainly be some outperformance from some of those those financials. Given our view that we think that bond rates should rise up uh, at some stage, we just think that the yeah, there's the, the various possibly technical reasons as to why they've been under such pressure. Maybe there's just been such a consensus trade that yields should be rising, and so there's just been so much positioning in that any kind of any small amount of bad news has basically resulted in these yields contracting as a result. But we think they will rise up, and as a result, that should unlock value um, in some of these value sectors like financials, and those are really spread. They're pretty much spread, spread globally, I would say. So thank you so much uh, for that, as always. Very interesting insights. Uh, thank you. Of course, that was Saul Miller. He's a portfolio manager at Truffle Asset Management.